Manager at PLOS will open our afternoon session. I don't think I need to present in detail of PLOS, the Public Library of Science. Um, its creation finds its origin in an open letter that was written in 2000 by various scientists. And I just want to read a very short excerpt from this letter. We recognize that the publishers of our scientific journals have a legitimate right to a fair financial return for their role in scientific communication. We believe, however, that the permanent archival record of scientific research and ideas should neither, neither be owned nor controlled by publishers, but should belong to the public and should be freely available through an international online public library. Today, almost at the end, so almost 13 years after this open letter, where do we stand? Why should a researcher today publish with PLOS instead of a publisher like Elsevier, who is, I believe, a publisher uh, you know quite well, you, you worked, um, you um, participate in the direction of a journal, I think, and which other services PLOS should develop in order to support researcher in this ever-changing context. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much to the organizers uh, for inviting me here and for, for hosting such a, a great uh, um, conference and a, a really nice, diverse panel. It's a, it's a great contribution to Open Access Week. Thank you. Um, and as usual, I've got too many slides, but there are some things that I can skip over depending on interest. Um, one of the things... Uh, um, what I'm going to talk about briefly is growth of open access, both in terms of policy, although we've, we've heard a bit about that today already, and in PLOS. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of Cameron Nayland's work uh, in terms of how, how open science and open research can be illustrated through um, networks, and how uh, we as a publisher uh, and as a community of researchers need to be able to adapt to that network. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about managing the transition um, from subscription-based journal publishing to open access. And if there's time, I'll talk about the recent science paper which uh, um, exposed some open access publishers uh, uh, when they published a fake paper. Um, but I might not get there. Um, and so just want to let you know that you are free to use this presentation as long as you um, attribute the work to its authors and respect the rights and licenses associated with its components. So what is open access? And I know this, this is, can be quite a contentious issue, um, but what we think open access is, is not just free access, it's not just free to, to read, although that is important. It also means that there's no embargoes, and you can reuse the material, and it's that last vital component which makes open access open. And there's been a huge number of policies, uh, most uh, visibly within the past couple of years. I'm not going to go through these in details. If anyone's interested, I'd be happy to talk about them. But um, the US, the UK, which has perhaps uh, um, introduced certainly to some UK researchers uh, and publishers some controversial uh, um, um, mandates. Um, but also open access is now becoming global. And it's not just the EU. Um, and the, um, uh, the European Research Council, um, it's the Swiss SNF, and it's at sort of funder level, government level, and at the level of the universities. And this, this is a, a graph um, which actually just shows the rise, and that spans from initially 2003 to 2013, detailing the mandates um, around the world. And you can visualise this um, just with a map. Again, this is also from the same source, from Raw Map. Um, and PLOS has been a part of that since, uh, as a publisher since uh, 2003. We're 10 years old, but we're by no means the first open access publisher, as we heard from Copernicus. Um, BMC were also publishing before us. We're now the largest not-for-profit open access publisher, and we've been self-sustaining um, using an article processing fee since 2010. We publish seven open access journals. We initially launched PLOS Biology and PLOS Medicine, and they're run by professional um, editors. I was an editor um, on PLOS Biology for 10 years, 
um, and they're run in partnership with academics. Um, and they were there to, to show, essentially, that you could have high-quality research with open access. But they were very traditional. And then there were PLOS genetics, PLOS comp computational biology, PLOS pathogens, PLOS neglected tropical diseases, which are more like a society journal. They're run purely by academics with the support staff. And that was essentially to show that you can run a society-type journal and make it open access. And then the real innovation came with PLOS One, which was launched in 2006, and that wasn't traditional. And in that, there was a key, just one key change from every other journal, which was that editors and reviewers were not asked how important the work was or what the relevant audience was. I'm going to talk more about that um, in context later. Um, but the support for that was overwhelming. Um, and so PLOS by, by the numbers now, um, and these are actually now out of date, we've published uh, nearer 95,000 articles, um, 46 uh, of, of which are, are written by Nobel laureates, um, 170,000 authors. Um, so we're getting there, but open access in general is also increasing. These are, are some of the most well-known, uh, reputable open access publishers. They're also increasing in, in the number of articles they're publishing each year. Again, this is out of date, 2010. There was a report that was commissioned by the EU this year, which actually said there were about 50% of articles now made freely available or uh, made open access. Now, I think this is an overestimate for, for several reasons, and we've already actually, the Lasco and Bjork paper has already been mentioned. Um, they put it nearer to 20%, and that was at 2012. But I think we are at a tipping point now. Um, and it's no longer a question of if open access is going to happen, but when and how. But what does it actually mean to be open? And this um, <clears throat> can be phrased in two ways. You can talk about your work being able to help someone else. And this is work done by Cameron Nalen, and he uses this equation to illustrate this. Um, in terms of the probability of being able to help someone, depends on the actual people who are interested in your work that would use it were they to have it, the number of people that you can reach, and whether the information, even if they can get hold of it, can actually be used is in a, is in a format that they can use and find useful. And this proportion, he calls it this probability of reuse or proportion of reuse. It also works the other way. You know, what, what is the uh, uh, probability that someone out there can actually help you. So the probability of getting help depends on the number of people out there that create work that you're interested in, um, how easily they can contribute that work, uh, how easily their contribution can, can actually help you, and the number of people you can reach. And the key thing about this is that the amount of people out there who are actually interested in your work is fairly fixed, especially if it's a very small field. But ideally, what we need to do is make the ability to reuse that material, what uh, uh, Cameron here is calling friction, um, to make that as small as possible. In other words, to make it as easy as you can to, to reuse that information. And of course, we want to make the number of people you can potentially reach as large as possible to be sure that you're capturing those who are really interested in your work. And so he defines being open as acting to reduce friction, in other words, to ease up the use of that article and to maximize the number of people you can reach. And this is important for both outgoing and incoming information. And PLOS One's editorial model makes it easier to use that material. There aren't barriers to getting your information out there by other people telling you your work's not important enough. If it's technically sound, it can be out there. And of course, why does this matter? Well, there are the obvious reasons. Uh, scientific information is a public good, and we hold a public trust. But primarily, it's because the world has changed, and this is something that you all know. And the number we can reach is now potentially limitless. And so what we need to be able to do is to try and reduce that friction. And um, science has become now uh, not a process of targeting specific people 
through a very limited uh, uh, journal where you control access in order to target a specific number. It's become much more like a network. And like a network, whether it's um, uh, regulatory proteins and E. coli or association between ants, they have certain properties. And this is, it. This is again, this is nothing new. This is an illustration. It's a simulation that, that Cameron did. But the point here is that if you have uh, small networks, they tend to remain unconnected. And then at a certain size of the network, there's a, a rapid transition, a shift, where the probability of making connections between nodes in that network suddenly increases. And this is equivalent to saying at a certain size, friction suddenly decreases, and the ease of use of that material becomes, uh, it becomes much easier. And eventually, you get very large interconnected networks, and even uh, the end result ideally would be one system. And what would this enable? Are we seeing some use cases about this at the moment? Um, perhaps a famous case is Tim, Tim Gowers, a mathematician, who wondered whether he could collaborate to solve a, a mathematical problem. He posed this problem. I, I'm not a mathematician. I can't tell you the details of it. He put it out there on February the 1st. He didn't think it was actually going to be solved. Um, and he thought they might get somewhere by unknown collaborations out there somewhere on the web. And it was essentially solved a month later. And this just sort of tells you about the, the initial power of this sort of collaborative network. Another famous one is Galaxy Zoo, where they mapped, uh, and this is more a citizen science project, where they mapped thousands and thousands of galleries by putting the images out there and getting anyone who wanted to take measurements from it. It's a fantastic example. Um, at PLOS, we're trying to provide um, um, examples of, of good use cases where people are using open, uh, open access um, and open research to, to provide innovations in different fields. Um, the major sponsors are Google, PLOS, and the Wellcome Trust, but there are many others. Um, this, the uh, winners were announced just on Monday this week um, in Open Access Week, and I won't go through them, but one was Daniel Meachin's work where he can crawl, he's provided a tool that can actually crawl the literature, check the license, and extract images, videos, and audio uh, material where he's able to reuse it and then host it up onto Wikimedia so that anyone can use it. There's also an example um, in terms of, uh, of an developing anti-malarial drugs and even a, a smartphone app about um, um, HIV self-testing. And so how can we um, then, as a community, start to adapt to this network? And ideally, what we want to be able to do is to reduce friction, to, uh, uh, to maximise and, and reduce friction, to make things easier to reuse. Um, and we can look at this in certain areas. We've seen this cartoon already once this morning. Um, it's the classic one that every publisher uses. Um, and this, I want to talk about research assessment and whether actually what we're doing is working. And this is a paper um, that was published a couple of weeks ago in PLOS Biology by Adam Air Walker, a, a professor at Sussex University in, in the UK, and a colleague, Nina Stoletsky, where they analysed um, how scientists uh, rated papers, and they looked at rankings of papers in Faculty of Thousand and on a Wellcome Trust grant panel where they were assessing the, the quality uh, of different papers. And so he looked uh, at, at uh, papers where, where papers had been scored more than once by two scientists, and then he looked at this in relation also to citations and to impact factor. And he was asking the question whether scientists can assess merit. Um, with the definition of merit being whatever it is that makes a scientist rank a paper highly. Um, and this is, this is a snapshot of, of just the faculty of, of a thousand data set. And the basic message is that if you look at the correlation between scientists and how they rank papers, it's incredibly low. In other words, a scientist ranking a paper is good, it, uh, you know, one scientist is ranking a paper as bad, one scientist is, is ranking a paper more highly. If you then look at the, at the rank that they give and then correlate that with the eventual citations five years later and as a measure of impact as opposed to merit, that's also incredibly low. So, <clears throat> and these are his conclusions that 
subjective assessments of science are incredibly poor. There's a very weak correlation between assessors. And not only that, because he also looked at the impact factor, he showed it was hugely biased by the impact factor. So this is even where scientists are asked not to rate the journal. Basically, if you control for the impact factor, the correlation is, is incredibly low. And this is one of the reviewers, Carl Bergstrom, says it's not that evaluators fail to predict some objective measure of merit. It's not clear, after all, what that objective measure of merit might be. But whatever this paper shows is that whatever merit might be, scientists can't be a good job of evaluating it when they rank the importance or quality of papers. They're no good at ranking how important a paper is. In terms of predicting future impact, they're also uh, 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 not good at doing that. And this is partly because they're not good at assessing merit, but also because the way citations uh, accumulate on a paper are, is, is very, very variable. It's almost by chance. And it's also affected by the impact factor. So journals in a, a high impact factor journal are inflated in terms of citations. Um, and he makes the point that the last research assessment exercise, whereby the UK government assesses um, the, the work of universities and scientists through a peer review where, where, journal, where papers are ranked, um, costs 60 million. And it's not clear that they're actually getting any value for money. He also showed that multiple assessors don't make much difference, the number of citations or the impact factor exaggerate differences, and that assessor bias uh, through that could affect the ranking of universities and tenure. Um, and one of the conclusions was that you basically have to abandon subjective ratings of articles. He did also talk about the impact factor being maybe the, the least bad measure because it reflected a process of peer review that happened before publication um, and therefore the reviewers weren't biased by the journal. Uh, but the impact factor, as he points out in his article, is so error prone anyway. I mean, that's, uh, that's not a great thing. Um, and this is partly, again, coming back to PLOS One's uh, um, um, process, is why it's important to remove subjectivity. You want stuff to be technically sound, but how you measure importance um, is, is something that often takes time by the community. Um, to look at and doesn't come out for, it might not come out for, for months or years after a paper's been published. And the problem is, is, at the moment, this subjective ranking of papers and the subjective assessment actually holds up um, the uh, communication of science because articles get rejected from different journals, they go through rounds and rounds of peer review. And just, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's not clear what citations, citations actually mean but I just threw this in just to show you that, that you know, PLOS One doesn't have a subjective uh, uh, assessment of its importance, but the top 200 articles in PLOS One are actually, actually highly cited. So if we don't have uh, uh, subjective uh, assessments of, of science, um, what is the best way to try and measure the impact of any paper? And PLOS has been developing article level metrics um, to do this, um, which has been discussed briefly. And um, I'm just aware of the time, so I'll just go through this quite quickly. Um, but the idea is that instead of just judging a paper by where it's published in, you take a whole suite of different metrics. It's very, very likely that the scientists, the ranking of scientists doesn't correlate because different scientists are ranking different things in the paper. What, what merit is to one scientist is not the same as what merit is to another scientist. Likewise, it's unclear what citations are telling us at the moment. We don't yet know. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of the analysis of, of different types of metrics, but these need to be collected uh, um, uh, uh, and looked at. And the important point is to take the focus off the journal where the article is published and put it onto the actual article. What is it that the article uh, um, is showing in terms of... of um, cit its citations to itself or um, its usage and even in regards with um, social networking. And so for every paper on PLOS and this, this will apply because PLOS has an open API to article level metrics, other people can take this and use this. Um, we flag clearly um, on the article how many times it's been viewed. There's a, a metrics tag you can go to and get a rundown of all the individual data about that, you can actually go to the site and extract this data and analyze it. 
Um, and, you know, uh, what it shows is that re uh, readers are interacting in different ways with the articles. There's many more page views than uh, downloads, although actually that's correlated, um, and, and so on. You can actually start to examine reader behavior. You can also extract um, different information. Um, these are uh, FP7-funded uh, papers, and this just shows you um, how long uh, since publication time, how many views um, they've had, and the bubble represents the size of citations. It's not clear what this tells you, but it's interesting to look at how different papers differ and why they might differ. This is actually publications um, from uh, Lausanne, from 2010 until um, 2012, um, which does exactly the same thing. And it shows you that there's some very large bubbles um, and there's some small, uh, um, that one is actually, I uh, don't know if anyone knows the authors of that one, um, but that, that's obviously been cited hugely. There's, uh, I, didn't, I didn't flag, oh yeah, that one is another one, that's by Lauren Keller. That one's been cited less, that was actually a front section article, but downloaded. Um, a lot, more than 61,000 times. Likewise, you can look at the location of your collaborators, um, and, and for Lausanne, those are all over the world. Um, so that's one way to reduce uh, friction, is to take the focus off the importance of article and look at actually article level metrics. Another way is to help free up the data. And we're doing this um, um, through several routes. We have a partnership with Dryad, which is a um, a repository that takes very heterogeneous data. I mean, one of the problems with, with hosting data is that um, it's, most data isn't like a gene sequence, and actually um, hosting all sorts of variable data is difficult. Dryad provides a solution for that. We also have a partnership with Figshare, which allows us to um, display the supporting information files um, it much, uh, uh, much more easily, and people can extract the information from that. I'll show you about, a bit about that in, in a minute. And it's, it's trying to interact and, and ensure that we can connect with these different platforms also helps to reduce, reduce the friction in the network rather than trying to keep everything within a PLOS environment. Um, and we have planning in hand for a dating sharing statement whereby all authors are going to be asked to... Uh, write a statement that goes on the front page of their article about how their data is made available and where it is, uh, it is deposited. There are going to be some exceptions, for example, patient confidentiality or endangered species and that sort of thing, but in general we're going to try and, and enforce that. Um, and people will have to publish that uh, before they can publish with us. This is just showing you some images um, um, in our supplementary file with the Figshare logo and then you can go straight to Figshare and download the figures from there. I'm going to skip over this just because of time, but we're also interested in how research is validated and reproduced. Um, and then uh, in terms of managing uh, the transition, um, open access is certainly increasing, but we're not there at the moment. And we need to uh, put in place um, or ensure that certain things happen happen now before it becomes too too late. And one of the ideas, uh, one of the, one of the things we need to do is to help drive down costs through competitions. And this is especially true for for APCs. It's not sh yet clear what the right price should be for APCs, but there are many websites and publishers you go to where it's not clearly displayed exactly what the price is. So we need much more about price transparency. We need to avoid replacing the big subscription deals, which is part of the reason that uh, led to, to, to the library crisis and the problems in publishing with deals that are, are managing big APCs where there are uh, discounts and perhaps non-disclosure agreements where you don't quite know what's going on. Of course, we want to discourage double dipping. And we think that there is a need for a mixture of repositories and, and uh, OA journals. Um, and like uh, the ERC, we, we think that disciplinary-based repositories are probably um, going to be more sustainable in the long term um, because they're more interoperable. Again, we need to encourage competition and also collaboration and make sure that there is a, a, a sort of a, a coherent global policy. I mean, one of the problems now is that there are so many different types of mandates that it's very difficult to know what's happening. 
And of course, resources are allocated, and so we have got to work out where it is uh, uh, that we need to place those resources. Um, one of the things is that the creation of these different platforms, um, like Figshare, um, that help to sort of increase the number of people you, you reach and reduce friction, but they also require investment. And we don't even yet understand the balance between the different things we're trying to look at, or even uh, um, we don't even understand how people are actually the process of sharing itself and how knowledge is shared. Um, and so there's lots of, of difficult decisions still to be made that are undecided. And I don't think any one publisher or any one community has the answer, and we need to work together to develop those. So I think I'm out of time, probably. Uh, no, okay, I can talk very briefly then about the, the si science. How many people know about the science paper? Okay, so, so I don't need to tell you too much. Basically, there's a bogus article submitted to hundreds of publishers, um, and uh, some of them, uh, I, I think about 100, more than 100 publishers accepted the bogus article. And so I, <clears throat> this is the map of where those articles were accepted in red. Um, I mean, one of the things is, is that we know there are dodgy journals out there, and we know there are dodgy publishers out there. And so the data, in a way, was useful it's confirmation, uh, as confirmation, but it is very limited. And, uh, one of the problems is that there was no control. It was not submitted to any subscription journals. So we don't know what would happen um, if it were submitted to subscription journals. Also, it was quite selective. They only included um, those journals that charged for APCs. Um, the majority of open access publications, as opposed to open access publishers, are actually published with reputable open access publishers. We also know that there are some very high profile legacy publishers, which were also accepted the paper. So being an old traditional publisher doesn't guarantee um, that you wouldn't get stung. I think this, the, the paper does raise issues about peer review, some of which I, I've discussed, um, and how effective peer review actually is. What's interesting, I'm also on the board of OASPA, the Open Access Scholarly Publishing uh, Association, and we've been reviewing the responses of uh, some of the submissions that accepted the articles. And some of the papers actually were reviewed and the reviewers identified flaws and then the paper was accepted. So there was a lack of sort of editorial oversight or editorial responsibility at a, a sort of later stage in the process. And I think there is a problem here in that, um, you know, s some academics are putting their names to journals that they're not actually being responsible for. And I think there, there is a problem here in both about uh, academics checking what they're actually signing up to before they uh, uh, um, put themselves down as an editor and then taking ownership for the, for the peer review process on the journal. One of the problems was that science spun the story in their press release um, as a, a problem with open access. I don't think it is a problem with open access. I think there are dodgy banks, there are dodgy insurance scams, uh, you know, you don't write off for the entire industry. Um, and I don't think it's an indictment of, of open access, but I, 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 and I think this, they will, there'll be a selection and people will realise. And I think part of the problem now is naivety with uh, people actually submitting papers there, um, acting as editors for some of those journals. And they're really, it, there's, there's, if you don't know how to spot them, come and speak to me afterwards. There's, there's a whole list I can, I can tell you about. Um, this is one of the problems we've seen this slide. Actually, you know, half of open access journals don't charge APCs. Those weren't included. And this is another cartoon. And I think a lot of this is, is the sort of absolute pressure um, to publish um, has helped create this sort of market. And the thing to do is to just check, you know, that you are with an, a reputable open access publisher, as you would if it were, you would check it was a reputable subscription journal. And, and OASPA actually has a code of conduct um, that uh, you need to sign up to if you want to become a member. 
and publish and check. Uh, they do charge a fee, so there are some reputable open access publishers who won't, aren't with OASPA, but that's a good place to start if you're unsure about where to publish. So at the end, how do we all stay afloat in this, in this system? What we have to do is provide quality of service, value for money. We have to make sure we're sustainable. We have to provide impact. Researchers and authors need to have that and funders, whatever impact is. I mean, ultimately, our core business is to get the author's work into the hands of those who can use it. So it's no longer about dissemination. It's, it, I mean, it is about dissemination rather than distribution. It's about discovery rather than filtering. And it's about platforms and linking platforms together rather than individual services. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, quite motivating uh, presentation, putting some facts in the right place. Um, are there some questions? <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, going back to your formula that is very nice and simple, where you have to minimize, let's say, the friction and maximize the N as the other value stay fixed. Don't you think that this, in this shift from being um, content carriers to be service providers, you are kind of transforming the publishing industry, becoming like a web service or market service, where the web service, uh, it is very useful to, to erase the friction, and the marketing service uh, just boosts the visibility of papers. And uh, how can this impact the research, in your opinion? Well, uh, you have to reduce the friction, uh, inc increase the, the number of people that is reading the papers. So there are two, too many, uh, there, there are two major possibilities where the, the, the industry is tra transforming, that is becoming a web service, so to reduce the friction, uh, to become, uh, let's say, marketing, uh, consulting, oh, whatever. My, my so to, to augment the visibility of the papers. To, to boost the, the, the searching ranking, I don't know. Well, I mean, I think, is it, is it on? Uh, I mean, I think all publishers have a, have a market, most publishers have a marketing department already, um, and, and in terms of web services, I think since we've, we've gone online, we have, you know, that, that is part of publishing. Both of those are part of publishing. What's going to distinguish um, publishers now is, is the quality of service they provide for that, and that is going to depend, uh, and that will determine whether authors actually submit to uh, individual journals. So I don't think it's going to uh, change the nature of, of research in that way, it's just changing the way we're going to uh, disseminate material. Um, ultimately, authors and readers will vote with their feet. If authors are getting the right service from a publisher, they're getting the kudos from their funders, they're getting grants because they've they've had publications in certain places, um, then they're going to carry on. But ultimately, readers need tools and services. They need to be able to extract information regardless of which publisher uh, has published the material. Um, and so it's, it, th there, is a, there is a slight tension there, um, but you know, it's, a, it's a good selection process. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but... I will think about Thanks. Okay, <laughs> thanks. No more questions or okay.